I'm going to give you a little more background of uh, Obama's dangerous inexperience and that we're in very, very grave trouble because we can see with the Gulf oil spill, he's out of his, his depth, number one. He's trying to change the discussion to health care to show you how, I don't know the word for this, and I'm lost for words, which is very bad for a person in talk radio. Do they actually think that you're that stupid, that you want to hear him talk about health care right now rather than the Gulf oil spill? Who would listen to this man? And moreover, who is advising him? And number three, where is Rahm Emanuel? Why am I the only one asking the question? Rahm Emanuel is AWOL. He's the chief of staff to Obama. Is he back in Chicago? If so, is he advising Obama? Do you think Rahm Emanuel, as skilled and as intelligent as he is, would advise him to go out and start talking about health care at a time like this? I can't imagine how Emanuel would do that. You may not like Emanuel's politics, but don't ever call him stupid, please. Not in my presence. Now, to get back to the itch, then I'll tell you about the, uh, the uh, U.S. Navy and the Barbary Pirates and Leathernecks and how to treat the uh, uh, Somali pirates, which is not with a trial in New York, but with a gutting and throwing them to the sharks and why they're doing it to us. But that's second. The itch is first. So I took the Benadryl, didn't, didn't touch it. I go home. I take my normal four grams of vitamin C when I ever have any kind of problem to try that first. 4,000 milligrams, nothing, didn't touch it. So I said, now I'm really in trouble because you figure it's an antioxidant. It's some, uh, somewhat of an NSAID uh, uh, ascorbic acid in large doses. It didn't work. Took an aspirin, didn't work. I said, this is not good. So I spoke with a very wise woman who knows much more about medicine than most of the doctors I know. And we were talking about dinner, and I said, I'm almost afraid to go to dinner because I don't want to put any food in my body, given that this is getting, you know, this is bad. So she said, how about going to the Chinese that you like, which you haven't been to in months, that has that hot green sauce? I said, how could I eat hot green sauce? It's liable to make it worse. She said, well, like cures like. She said, you wrote a book on homeopathy 20 years ago. She said, it's always worked for your illnesses before. And remember when you were dying, you almost died from food poisoning in uh, Thailand. And the first thing you ate was a, a spicy pizza with garlic the next day. <laughs> I did. I swear, the first thing I reached for was pizza with chopped garlic on it. The day after the worst food poisoning incident of my life, I was near death the night before. So it's a weird thing. I said, all right, well, let's say some of the remnant of that, whatever that did it to me, if it's food born, let's try the Chinese. I'll know right away. So before I left the house, I drank a half a beer to test the alcohol. And you know what? The alcohol worked a little bit. So I figured, all right, I'm going to go to the restaurant and drink too much and eat too much. Mile Briashi, that's the thing. So I go there. We go out in the Geary Avenue where there's one Chinese restaurant after another, one after the other. Incredible. I go to a place that serves a kind of food called Hakka, which is a, a clay pot dish, which I signed off on. Remember I said it was no good anymore? But the sauce is unbelievable. So I go back. I ordered salt-baked chicken. I'm just giving a quick rundown. They have a house specialty, salt-baked chicken, but it's not salty. It's a strange phenomenon, but it's the most delicious chicken. I hate chicken, but it's the only chicken I and then I got a, 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 a seafood clay, a seafood basket, which again you would think, are you crazy? And I dipped it like mad in the green sauce. It's a hot, it's a sweet hot chili sauce. I don't know how to explain it. I dipped it like crazy. I drank two beers, and the itch more or less almost went away completely. It's still there in, in slight remnant. So the like cures like. In other words, if it had gotten worse, I would have stopped eating altogether, and then I would have said, okay, it's not food born. It's probably from another aspect of the environment. But that's called, reason, you know, it's called deduction. That's how a, a thinking mind works. It's something that the president's not capable of. In other words, if you see an oil spill like this, the first thing you do is ask yourself, how do you stop it? You don't start blaming people. What do you use to stop it? Jindal of Louisiana, the governor, has been begging him for permission to, to, to let him build, erect temporary sand berms. And five different U.S. agencies under Obama were fighting with each other over whether he can build them because it might damage the environment. You hear this? It just shows you the stupidity of the people in government. Now to get back to the thing I raised before, the pirates, even though it's not in the news, it's on my mind because we have a Navy that doesn't fire a shot and it's pissing me off. I'm a member of the Navy League. I'm a lifetime member of the Navy League. I love the Navy and I cannot for the life of me understand how so many admirals cannot be firing a shot when we have so many enemies around the world. Case in point, the pirates. So the Navy SEALs shot one or two pirates, and the command had to come out of somewhere in Washington or Tampa Bay. They had the pirates in their sights for four hours, by the way, the snipers, 
on the ramps, had the snipers in their sights for four or five hours. They were not allowed to fire a shot. The same way Obama's not letting them build the berms. You hear this? Now, the United States and the Barbary Pirates. 1784, first American ship seized by pirates from Morocco. Right? What happens? The Americans had a president, Thomas Jefferson, actually, who was ambassador to France, and John Adams, then the ambassador to Britain. And they meet in London with uh, 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 Mr. Adja, the ambassador to Britain from Tripoli, where the piracy occurred. The Americans asked Adja why his government was hostile to American ships, even though there had been no provocation. The ambassador's response was reported to the Continental Congress. Listen carefully. It was written in their Quran that all nations which had not acknowledged the prophet were sinners, whom it was the right and duty of the faithful to plunder and enslave, and that every Muslim who was slain in this warfare was sure to go to paradise. He said also that the man who was the first to board a vessel had one slave over and above his share, and that when they sprang to the deck on an enemy ship, every sailor held a dagger in each hand and a third in his mouth, which usually struck such terror into the foe that they cried out for quarter at once. And so they started paying off the pirates with bribery. In fact, it reached so bad that the bribery amounted to 20% of United States government annual revenues in 1800. And so they set up a navy. They stopped paying, paying the, uh, the ransom. Because by late 17, uh, 1793, a dozen American ships had been captured. Goods had been stripped and everyone enslaved. Enslaved by the Muslims who said it was their duty as Muslims. Did you hear what I just said to you? Did you hear that? After the debate, the United States Navy was born in March 1794. Six frigates were authorized, and so began the construction of the United States, the Constellation, the Constitution, and three other frigates. The military presence helped to stiffen American resolve to resist the continuation of ransom to the pirates. It led to the two Barbary Wars along the North African coast. It was not until 1815 that naval victories ended ransom payments by the United States. And here we have come full circle with the most powerful navy in the world, unable to fire a shot because of Barack Hussein Obama's policies of appeasement.